Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you're attending this webinar. I'm Randy Manaply, and I'm here with the pickleball guru, Prem Carnot, the world's premier pickleball coach, to discuss the five biggest mistakes tennis, table tennis, and racquetball players make when playing pickleball. Prem, what's everyone going to get out of this webinar? Hello, Guru Nation. Welcome. Very much uh, excited to share uh, these information with you guys. You are in the right place. If brand new to pickleball and played lots of other racket sport, brand new to pickleball, played only one other racket sport, you have been playing pickleball for a while, you're a great player in your area, but want to know how you can stack up at the national level. And Prem, you probably know more about pickleball than just about anyone else, but it didn't happen overnight. Just like a superhero movie has an origin story, like Spider-Man being bitten by a radioactive arachnid, Prem, how did you become the guru? Oh, Randy, I'm not going to say that I became the guru. I was given the moniker, the guru. But um, it all started like anyone else. You know, um, years ago, uh, I moved uh, from France uh, uh, to the Pacific Northwest with my wife and bought a place in a remote island called Harstein Island in Washington State. And uh, during my time in that island, uh, uh, a gentleman uh, tried to get me to hook up to this game called pickleball, which was played next to where I was playing tennis. And um, I was pretty reluctant to do so, but I ended up actually playing one time to try and, you know, uh, get the gentleman away from me. And uh, that was the beginning and the end of my tennis career, beginning of a pickleball career, because I started playing pickleball getting addicted to it and uh, more pickleball and uh, obviously uh, at the beginning I was uh, I thought I was such a great tennis and a table tennis player but um, got my um, my butt uh, royally handed over to me by um, a bunch of um, older gentlemen and realized that there was more nuance to this game than I actually knew and that actually you know picked up my curiosity and I started playing this game for a while till the same gentleman who introduced me to the game invited me to play the very first Nationals in 2009. Um, and uh, when I went there, I discovered something very different. Uh, I was playing something else. Uh, those guys were playing pickleball, but I definitely was playing something else. <laughs> um, it was a, a, an eye-opener for me, and it was the very first tournament, uh, national tournament uh, in the United States. Um, but luckily for me, most of the players out there were from the Pacific Northwest, uh, or at least a lot of them who won that tournament or in the bundle brackets were from the Northwest. So I had the opportunity to befriend them and go and play a lot. Played an enormous amount of pickleball since then, and you know played almost 10 hours every day. And obviously my game got better and went back to the Nationals the next year. Uh, we still got beaten up, but at least uh, a lot better presence than we did the year before. Right. You were more competitive. And, uh, we were more competitive or we were also a little bit more consistent. Um, so uh, it was uh, it was much more satisfying for us and we continued playing. And at some point uh, we decided to rent our house out and, you know, travel around the country with a VW bus and play pickleball. Um, at uh, one of those stops uh, in San Diego, um, California, when I was playing there, a gentleman asked me to help him out uh, because, uh, you know, I was one of the top players and I helped him out. And then one thing led to the other and he started calling me the pickleball guru and wanted me to be a professional teacher um, because he thought that I had good uh, good understanding of the game and, and also a passion for the game that would um, easily translate into a good teaching uh, uh, position. Uh, I hesitantly did that uh, a few number of years ago, and uh, that started the journey of Pickleball Guru, and here I am traveling across the world now, teaching Pickleball for the past uh, seven years, I would say now, and uh, enjoying it very, very much, as much as I enjoyed it the very first time I picked the racket. So that's the journey. Uh, so I learned a lot, got beat a lot. Uh, <laughs> But I also learned, uh, you know, to be much more humble with uh, with myself and with my opponents, and uh, learned a lot of life lessons uh, along the way. Uh, 
thanks to the large pickleball community and ever-growing large pickleball community nowadays. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that, Prane. So here's what you're going to get out of the webinar today. We're going to learn the five biggest mistakes you must correct to get better results and have more fun on the pickleball court. How to change your grip to get rid of all that muscle memory associated with your current grip. Answers to the most common questions about adjusting from other sports to pickleball. The new way to hit your strokes so that they land in the kitchen from anywhere on the court. And how to avoid the uncertainty of tailoring your game with better or weaker players so you can challenge yourself and again have more fun. So here's what we're going to cover here. We're going to cover the two player archetypes, the five biggest mistakes, and then we're going to have the top three FAQs, how to adapt your stroke to pickleball, how to be more patient, and how to play up and down. So, Prame, let's give everyone a disclaimer first. What we're talking about here, this is not the only way to play pickleball or the only way to have a stroke. It's just a way, correct? Absolutely. I am a strong believer that it's only a way. I don't pretend nor claim that this is the only way. It's a very effective, smart way to do it, but it doesn't mean it's the only way. And to kind of buttress this argument, uh, one of the things that you say a lot is if something works for you, keep doing it. Don't change it. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of that. You know, why would you change something which works for you? Um, and, you know, whatever you're going to learn and, you know, you can incorporate into your game, just add it to your arsenal. You just have more tools in your arsenal so that you have much, much more options. And the other two things to add here, if you're not getting the results you want, you, you pretty much have to try different things to find out exactly what is going to work for you. And that's pretty much where you come in uh, for everyone here in this webinar, right, Prane? Absolutely. You know, you kind of keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. So you've got to have to try something different uh, to, if you want to have uh, different uh, results. It's it's pretty obvious as far as I'm, I'm being straightforward with it, uh, not being you know, my intention is to be blunt, but not to be arrogant about it. It's more clear that if uh, things are not working the way we would like to, then we might have to try different options to see what works for us. And I'm always there to help anyone uh, to figure out what would work for, for them individually. And the final point here we want to make is that what may be working for you against the local big dogs, in other words, where you play uh, typically your rec play, may not work out too well when you're facing the real big dogs, like when you actually go to a tournament. That's true. Um, you know, it's like being a, a big fish in a small pond. You know, you feel very, very comfortable in, the, in a small pond. But then obviously, if you go into a river or lake or the ocean, obviously, you know, that's when you really realize if you are actually big or not. All right. Thanks, Prane. And the first thing we're going to talk about now is the two-player archetypes. Prane, what are the two-player archetypes? Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the false prodigy. What is the false prodigy, Prane? The false prodigy, just as I told you before, and, um, about, you know, 80% of the players out there, you know, they might be, you know, um, they might be really, you know, a small fish, but big in a small pond. And so they think that they, because they have a background from sports, uh, they are able to get away with most of the players who they play against locally. And uh, they have this, um, you know, satisfaction of thinking that they are actually the big dog. And believe me or not, I thought myself was the same way. I thought I was the king of the hill of my little island where I was uh, until I realized uh, that I was not. Um, I was probably a hamoeba um, <laughs> in the world of pickleball, of real competitive pickleball. And it was very humbling and um, worth no noting that it was uh, good for uh, to humble my ego, even though I came from strong racket sport backgrounds. So that's one of the uh, ideas I realized that I was not as a, a prodigy as I thought I was. I was just uh, a misnomer. A misnomer. And that brings us to our second archetype, which is the struggling student, which is a 
guessing around 20% of the players. Prem, what's the struggling student? The struggling student is the one who keeps getting beaten all the time, really enthusiastic, really hooked by the game, really wants to try hard to improve their game. And But the, every time they get beaten by players who are better than them, or and, uh, and there is a sense that, you know, I should do better because I do have some racket sport background behind me. I should be doing better than what I'm being doing. And they get so frustrated with it. Uh, that's the group of players who are, you know, totally struggling and really needing help to figure out how to move to that next level. And it doesn't really matter which one you are, whether you're the false prodigy or the struggling student. It really says less about your skill level and more about the people you play with and against. Uh, I'll say the false prodigy has a harder time improving because they don't have to pay for their mistakes. You see a lot of this with tennis players that they have a good stroke. They come into the game. Maybe they still hang out at the baseline, but because they have such a good stroke, they're, they're able to get the ball back with no problem. But with that, there comes a lot of baggage. They never change what they're doing because it still works for them. Now, the struggling student, they don't have any preconceived notions. They're, they're not falling back on anything because they're already paying for their mistakes. Is there anything you want to uh, say about that? Yeah, for sure. And as I said before, you know, um, you know, you say, well, it keeps working for me, then why should I have to change? You know, it goes completely contrary to what we just mentioned earlier on and said, if something works for you, keep it in your arsenal. It does work for you, then keep it in your arsenal. But when you're starting to measure again players who are probably a little bit better than you, and then you realize that it doesn't work, that's when we need to change, or uh, the, the false, false prodigy, as you call it, um, we'll have to make some, you know, um, some inward uh, thinking process to try and get the game uh, into the next level and next gear and change the way we play because what worked for us in a certain level may not work in a different level. Uh, so that's one way of looking at it. As far as the struggling student goes, uh, it's true just because they're struggling, they're open. Most of the time they are open to trying to see what they can do to improve. The idea is not to be com competitive. The idea is for most of them is to try and have a better game so that they feel really good after having played well when they leave the court. Uh, irrelevant of the win or loss, that at least they don't have a sense that uh, they, you know, they got beat, but they actually played a very good game. So that is that is my intention and my goal to any student, especially to that group of players who really, really want to improve. And it doesn't matter whether you're a false prodigy or a struggling student. This training, this webinar is going to certainly help. So, like a certain superhero in his first movie, let's count them down. The first mistake is not getting to and staying at the line. Prane, this especially applies to tennis players that tend to want to hang out at the baseline. We can watch lots of tennis matches on TV, and it's mainly a baseline game. That doesn't really work well with pickleball. How big a mistake is it to hang back and not get up to the non-volley zone line? Um, it's, I wouldn't really call it a mistake. Uh, you know, um, again, it's, uh, it's, it's the game as far as tennis goes. Um, it's the, the lot of rallies has to happen. Uh, deep rallies have to happen for someone to come charging in to attack a ball. Again, the point is finished at the net in tennis. It's the same way. Um, it's, it's the same way, you know, in, in, in pickleball, the, the game is won and lost mostly close to the net. So in this particular game, since we don't really have such a big court like in tennis, uh, you know, where you need to set up a long ways before to try and charge in uh, to, you know, hit a deep passing shot to a corner so that you can actually charge in to finish off on a volley. Um, here in this game, you have to actually try and hit a shot which allows you to get to the non-volley zone line where you start dominating that line. And that's where the game is won and lost. I've never seen a pickleball game won by anyone just by playing on the baseline. So the game is won and lost at the non-volley zone line. And uh, most of the times, players coming from tennis backgrounds, including me, um, were, were, we were prone to be standing back because tennis is different. We are not playing tennis pickleball. 
unfortunately, we are playing pickleball, which has got its unique set of skill sets which we need to develop. Um, there's a lot of tennis we can bring into this game of pickleball, but there's a lot of tennis you don't want to bring to, to the game of pickleball. And that one aspect is very important. Hanging back is not an option. Try and hit a ball which allows you to get to the non-body zone line. So the obvious solution to this mistake is to get to the line, stay at the line, and dominate the net. Uh, on that number two point, stay at the line. This also means once you get to the line, uh, you don't really recommend backing up for anything, do you? Why do you get in trouble when you begin to back up, Prem? It's pretty straightforward. When you start backing up from the non-volley zone line, it means that the opponent across the net is able to see more off you and especially more off your feet. Uh, more of your feet they can see, more they can head downwards towards you, but less of your feet they see, which means that you're closer to the net, less they can see off your feet, which means that they can't really hit it down unless you give them a really high volley. They're not going to see you at all, So, which means that closer to the net, is, you give them less angles to play with. Further away from the net, you're giving them a lot more spaces to go for so being at the net is a very important one. I would actually quote one of my fellow friends, um, Dave Weinbach, um, who, who was, a, was a top pickleball player who would say something like this. Good things happen when you move forward. Bad <laughs> things happen when you move back. Oh, I like that. I'm stealing that. Uh, on to mistake number two now, not clearly communicating with your partner. This is more than just discussing who serves first, right, Prem? Absolutely. And, you know, um, you know, most of the other racket sport communication is, uh, um, you know, is re remains pretty minimal um, and most of the time, you know, about strategies and everything is set, probably preset before the game starts. A little bit of communication happens between points, uh, whereas uh, I think in this game of pickleball, um, a lot of communication uh, happens and is recommended and suggested I definitely recommend you to talk a lot with your partner and say, yours, mine, you know, move this way, I'm going to lob right now, whatever it is, whatever the words you're going to use, but communicating in, um, effectively and letting your partner know what you're going to do and if, when let your partner know what they're going to do to you makes it easier for you to prepare to, for the type of shots you're looking for. And that's um, an important part of this game of pickleball. So the solution is call every shot, no matter what, stay in position, and dance with your partner. Prem, could you discuss dancing with your partner a bit more? Ah, uh, I love that one. You know, in my boot camp, we have a session called Dance with Your Partner, which I really, really love. Um, the session here on the, about dancing with your partner is to really be moving in tandem side to side with your partner, not back and forth so that much uh, unless it's being lobbed over you, but mostly side to side at the non-volley zone line. You want to be about six to seven feet away from each other and move in tandem to know where the ball is and always be in front of the ball and move in tandem about six to seven feet from each other. That gives you a very effective doubles play in pickleball, a very important one too. All right, thanks, Prem. We're at number three now, Prem, hitting the ball hard and with spin on every shot. I see this again a lot with tennis players. It seems like tennis players, when transitioning to pickleball, continue to use what worked in tennis, and this will serve them okay against some players, but not so much against the real big dogs, like we refer to some of the players as. I agree, uh, Randy, and I'll be the first one to tell you this is uh, something which I worked myself. And I remember in my early days when I used to use a lot of spin coming from a very strong tennis and table tennis background, um, every time my, uh, my fellow uh, players would always say, take that spin away from me, oh, and um, I would be so adamant because it was – so juicy and I was getting away with it with especially a lot of players who do not know what to do with the spin. Uh, I would put a lot of uh, revolutions on, on the ball. Uh, but I realized that every time I would do that against good players, I used to get tagged. You know what it means? Getting tagged? 
Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's basically getting hit all the time. So it's um so it it it's actually um, you know I started realizing that uh, my uh, prep work for to spin a ball had uh, a lot to do with it because to try and spin a ball a pickle ball um most of the time I had to try and cut the ball so much and that my ready position was away from my body which allowed them to tag me um so I had to cut short on my spin and try to play more effectively not having said that there are a lot of other spins you can definitely use in this game a return of serve can be used with a lot of spin or even a serve can be used with a lot of spin and some of the cross court spin um uh, ginks can be used with a lot of spin because the preparation uh, for that can be long, like in a tennis uh, play, but at least the ready position is going to be quicker because you're always in, in, in position by the time the follow-through is over because there's more time because the, 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 the time for the ball to travel across the net uh, gives you enough time to get ready. But some sides so spin like if you try to hit a ball in front of you and try to get brain to ready position, it's too late and you get attacked all the time. A correction to this mistake is to set yourself up until you can put it away. Prem, can you go into a little bit more detail about what you mean by setting yourself up? Setting myself, uh, setting yourself up is a very, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's straightforward. It's basically hitting balls where uh, your opponent are forced to always hit upwards and hoping at some point they hit a ball upward high enough for you to actually smash it downwards. And that is what I call setting yourself up. Um, I often call this as a, it's actually a trademark, it's called the crouching tiger technique. Um, it's basically a tiger uh, when it's in the wild about to attack its uh, prey, what it does. It crouches, it waits patiently till the uh, prey is not paying attention and then pounces on it. So it's the same vein in terms of um, pickleball, your soft, slow game is your setup game. It's basically you're crouching and waiting for the opportunity to pounce on your opponent when they have put the ball high enough for you to put it away or they're not paying attention, their paddle is not up or you know they're not in position. So there are so many strategies which uh, you can take uh, care of if if the ball is uh, given to you. So that's what I call setting yourself up to pounce. Thanks, Prem. The reason why I laughed earlier about uh, being tagged is because you were bearing the lead on me. Because this brings us to mistake number four, not keeping your paddle up. You've tagged me with the ball in the chest at least 10 times. And I still remember it well the first time I met you back in 2016. Why is it a mistake to let your paddle hang down below your waist, Prem? Why isn't it a mistake, uh, Randy? <laughs> um, the question simply, uh, you know, the the question is what what do you gain by having your paddle beneath your waist? Um, when you are at the non-volley zone line and if the paddle is beneath your waist, if someone is hitting you a ball towards your body or towards your belly or your chest, if your paddle is beneath your waist, when you're about to get hold of that ball, where do you think you're going to hit the ball? Generally upwards, which means that you're setting your opponent up to put it away. Keeping your paddle up minimum chest level is going to give you a lot more options because you're going to hit the ball downwards towards someone's feet and over the net. But if you're keeping it beneath your waist, that means if you're hitting it downwards from that angle, you're probably going to hit it into the net or you're going to try and hit it upwards, which in both the cases is not a good one. So it is a very important part for me in terms of keeping your paddle up. In fact, I would go ahead and tell you that 80% of your game will improve no matter what your skill level is if you keep your paddle up and out. The other thing that I'll add to this is when you're holding it down below the waist, even easy shots uh, like overheads or forehands, you have to take that extra split second to bring the paddle up. And if you had your paddle up at your chest already, you're not wasting any of that time. It's already there 
and, and ready to go. Absolutely, Randy. In fact, uh, some of the people who ask me the question, why do I keep hitting my overheads into the net? And that's one perfect example of that split second is just that lateness by the time you make contact with the ball and trying to you know, hit it downwards, you're probably finding the net, the bottom of the net rather than over the net just because of that small adjustment which was not there. So the solution to mistake number four is keep your paddle up and out. Now we just talked about why it needs to be up. Why does it need to be out, Prem? Being out is to protect from most of the times when someone is hitting your hard balls. Keeping it out allows you to block the ball and you know bring the ball a little inwards towards you so that you can actually block effectively. But if you block it, if you keep it close to your chest and if you try to block it from there, there is no way you can bring your paddle down, which basically you're blocked by your chest, uh, which uh, doesn't give you any leverage for you to push the ball back across, and it may pop off. But by keeping it away from your body um, and away and out allows you to actually make contact with the ball a little bit ahead and uh, finish off the ball there if you had a hit, um, uh, you know, um, a volley, you know, uh, uh, either it's a block volley or it's it's a punch volley. In both the cases, keeping it out gives you more options. Keep it closer to your body, your options are limited. Right. Does that make sense? That makes absolute perfect sense. So, Prem, we're up to mistake number five, which is an interesting one. Bad karma. Uh, this is more than not holding the door open for someone. Well, Randy, um, in that particular case of bad karma, it's mostly because oftentimes when we are playing... Um, one of the biggest mistakes we do is like, you know, we just want to keep doing what we did in other racket sports and try and incorporate, push that one into, 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 into the game of pickleball. And oftentimes it doesn't work. Sometimes we might get away with it, but it is always not the case and trying to, you know, um, you know, trying to do that. And sometimes you get away with it, but most of the times when you don't get away with it, you get frustrated, you get angry, you you think uh, that uh, the other players are not playing well and, you know, you don't play in your level. And there's so many, uh, so many uh, complaints we tend to make when we don't do well. And um, uh, that's where the bad karma part is, is to try and how to change that one. So the easy solution is to chill out seriously, and remember where you came from. And as you like to say, Prane, it's supposed to be fun and it's only pickleball, right? Absolutely. That's my bottom line any day. Um, it is it is only pickleball and um, it's supposed to be fun and it is only pickleball. Very good. Now it's time for a quick recap. The first thing you want to do is get up to the line quickly so that way you can dominate the net. You want to be sure to communicate with your partner and call every shot. You want to avoid hitting every shot hard and with spin. What you really want to do is set yourself up until you can put it away with some aggression and a hard shot. And not having your paddle up and in the ready position, you want to have that paddle up and out, like Prem said earlier. And the last mistake is creating bad karma. You want to remember where you came from and, most of all, have fun. Now we're up to the part of the webinar where we have some bonus content. The first item, adapting your stroke. How and why should you change up your stroke, Prane? Okay. Um, in this one, it's pretty, uh, you know, uh, especially when we come from other racket sport background, the transfer of weight happens from back to front so that you actually get a lot of, a lot of oomph on the ball in tennis, especially so that you can actually – speed the ball up. Um, in this case, uh, you really don't want to speed the ball up uh, in most cases because there was a recent statistic which said that the team which ever which sped the ball up 80% of the time lost the point, um, which tells you that you've got to have to try and slow the, the, the rally down so that you're able to get an opportunity to put it away. Uh, to do that, which means that the transfer of weight does not actually happen from back to front anymore, more from front to front, which means that you make contact in front and move forward 
with the stroke, um, which means that uh, the big back swings you see in tennis uh, or even racquetball does not happen anymore. It's more a compact stroke. It, everything actually is mostly, you know, uh, at your um, hip level from anything you're shooting from the hip basically is what it is. And you're pretty much looking at a, a distance just not far away from your, your chest so that um, you're actually hitting most of the strokes, compact strokes in front of you. So not a big giant backswing, just kind of start it, like you said, kind of at your hip. Absolutely. Up, apart from return of serves, I don't see, and, you know, passing shots at, at times, I don't see the big backswings happening in the game of pickleball. And on this slide, we have a picture of changing your grip. What exactly does changing the grip, where you have your thumb running along the edge, what, what does that do for you, Prem? That's a really good question, Randy. And again, you know, I really want to make sure that I'm not saying this is all you have to do or this is the only way to do it. It's it's an ideal, effective way to do it for a certain number of people who struggle by keeping the grip so tight on the paddle, which forces them to actually strike the ball rather than actually try and drop it or have more control on the ball. Uh, if you can do it naturally, great. If you can't do it, here is a suggestion I often make. Uh, Take the thumb which you're holding, like if you have a shake hand grip or a continental grip on the paddle, take the thumb from where you're holding and put it on the side of the the, the racket handle so that it actually gives you leverage to actually not hit strike the ball because you lose all the power because it's much more looser on you when you're grasping the paddle uh, on that on that grip. So that gives you a lot more leverage to try and strike the ball that way. That's my suggestion. That's one of my recommendations for people who struggle by wanting to strike the ball with a, with a continental grip, for example. Yeah. And I'll say I, I started using the thumb along the edge and it, it works miracles actually. Uh, I know you say it's not the end all solution, um, but for my third shot drops, it, 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 it really started working really, really well. Uh, Absolutely. For some of the other players, especially for racquetball players, uh, you advise not to skim the net. I'm assuming that's because racquetball players, uh, because they want it, they want to hit it really low because they want it like an inch or two right above the floor when they hit. Uh, mm -hmm. What do, What do you mean by don't skim the net? Because the risks of that ball going in, into the net are pretty high. So, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The players who actually become better players are the players who actually make less unforced errors. So by hitting strokes which would eliminate any unforced errors or at least as much as possible unforced errors is the key. So hitting low shots is a high risk one. You might get away with it, and it's actually not a bad one, but you might get away with it for, for a few. But if you get the consistency, if you can do it 100 times out of 100, go for it. But if you don't, I think it's a pretty high risky one to do. It gives you a lot of margin when you're hitting shots, and you know maybe uh, you know about a foot, foot and a half over the net would give you the, the best possible way. But if you try to hit a racquetball stroke that high, that high, generally that ball is sailing out towards the fence or the wall behind you. So um, the idea is to keep the ball in play and somewhere on the court. So I would not recommend you to keep just trying to skin the net all the time because that's a pretty high percentage of uh, low percentage shot in terms of uh, in terms of how it lands in, in the other side of the court. And you have a drill where uh, I may not be saying this as well as I could, but you're essentially combining bowling and softball, and you're not using your paddle. Can you talk about this drill? Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things I often suggest is. Uh, to be able to, you know, get a lot of control in doing that. In fact, um, uh, what I would suggest to you is to take to take your paddle away from you, use your dominant hand, whichever hand it is, right or left, and um, 
you know, you're underarming it, like as if you're serving or hitting a stroke, and you actually bend your knees and lift with your knees and and drop the ball wherever you want it, be it a drop shot, be it a serve, or be it a return of serve, which basically gives you the leverage without having to do the big back swing. And um, it's, a, it's a very effective one. Okay, thanks, Prane. So we're up to the second part of our bonus content, how to be more patient. And this is where we'll plug the podcast, available on the website and other platforms, including iTunes, as Episode 5 is titled Patience Grasshopper. Prane, what does being more patient do for you on the court? And if you like, you can talk about your crouching tiger again. Um, being patient again is is about being able to be very effective um, on the court. You know, being patient means that means you have a lot more options uh, when you are uh, much more calmer, uh, and then which gives you more uh, insights on the on the court across the net which gives you more options where you want to strike the ball. And again, I would repeat what I said before about the, the crouching tiger technique. It's a technique which I um, trademarked, and it's something which I often, um, you know, suggest to, to, to people is, you know, what does a crouching tiger, what does a tiger do in the wild when it's about attack a prey? Um, it crouches, it waits patiently, and it goes uh, on the attack uh, when it knows a prey is well, most vulnerable or most uh, are not paying attention. It's the same way. I'm all about aggression. I just want you to be much more uh, aware that the soft game allows you to crouch just like a tiger and wait for the opportunity to pounce on your opponent when they're the most vulnerable. Um, and that's the that's the key to uh, to being patient because even that particular cat, the big cat which is so hungry, has to be patient to be able to attack uh, to to have the prey at the site. So um, for that to happen, uh, you got to have to work on your game of patience and knowing how to wait, you know, play the soft game until you get the opportunity where your opponent make the mistake for you to put it away. Now we're at the third part of our bonus content, how to play nice. So this means that I should apologize profusely if the ball dribbles off the net or I smash a ball into someone's chest. That's all I need to do on how to play nice, right, Prem? Absolutely, absolutely. You've got to have to, you know. You've got to say absolutely uh, not. <laughs> I wouldn't say absolutely not. I would say absolutely you should do that. You should probably wear even a uh, I'll probably give you a garb, a saint garb to be so that I would call you the the saint of the nicest niceties. Um no, truly to honestly that is not about being nice. Nice is about playing the most effective uh game possible and enjoying it without being mean to your opponents, but uh, enjoying a highly competitive play. And so, uh, yes, and so a good example would be, uh, let, let's say you're a couple of four O's and you're playing a couple of three O's, and, instead of just dominating them with your hard shots, uh, this, this is the time where you can practice dropping a shot into the kitchen every chance you get, no matter where you are on the court, right? We could use any type of, uh, you know, focus on any one set of, you know, thing we wanted to accomplish. And, you know, it could be a drop shot, like you said, and they could just work on that the whole time rather than trying to dom dominate your opponents because the goal is not to dominate. The goal is to get consistent. Um, consistent players make better players. Uh, people who make less mistakes are the ones who are considered to be, uh, you know, the ones who actually win. Um, I would quote one of my friend uh, Bjorn Borg when he said that uh, all he tried to do was to try and put one more ball over the net, and that um, that sums it all. You know, uh, he wasn't trying to. His best uh, notion was to, I keep putting the ball back in play and letting the opponents make the mistake. And so that's the same way I, I think of uh, pickleball is as long as you can get consistent and keep the ball in play and let your opponents make the mistake. And what I really like about this is uh, you say set yourself a personal challenge. And I'll go back to the example that I get, practice a drop shot every chance you get. Uh, that way, nice doesn't have to be boring. Uh, you know, you're getting some fun out of it by practicing on your game, and you're not 
dominating the other team or making them feel bad because there's such a level disparity. Absolutely. I totally agree with you on that. You know, it's that's you know, especially when you're playing recreationally and when you have a limited ac- access to courts uh, for in certain areas where there's no um, not much uh, court time and um winters uh, um, in certain places would, would reduce the amount of access to court you have. Um, those are the places where you actually can just practice when you're playing even recreationally against the not so good players on focusing on trying to get more consistent with your strokes. And you could use any one of those, like, you know, a drop shot, a serve, or return of serve, or hit how many dinks you want. Um, just getting, you know, or knowing how to get patient and, you know, knowing when to attack and, you know, building consistency in your game is, is a very effective strategy. Great. Thanks, Brain. So what's this all about? Drawing on your own racket sports experience and not being held back by it? Getting as good or even better at pickleball than whatever racket sport you previously played? Getting better results on the pickleball courts quickly without getting younger, faster, or stronger? There's an old saying that Father Time is undefeated. Not being intimidated on the court and discovering just how good you can be, which is a natural segue as to why are you here? It may be that you're sick and tired of losing to the same people that you think you should be able to beat. You've got that competitive spirit and you want to get good fast so you can start winning at tournaments. And you want to see just how far you can go without wasting a lot of time building bad habits. Now, what we hope is that you get this one thing out of here. Prame has developed the formula for transitioning to playing advanced pickleball. And it doesn't take a lot to quickly become better than. I don't know, 80% of the players out there praying? Yes, absolutely. I think so. And this is something that uh, you can do, and you can do it in a short period of time. And like we said, in this short period of time, you're automatically going to be playing better than 80% of the players out there throughout the country. So how do you use this information to improve your game? You could always take the really slow route. You could read all the books. You could watch all the YouTube videos. And you could wade through all the conflicting advice that's out there. And, and Prem, you would know more than I would. There's a lot of conflicting info out there on the interwebs and the YouTubes, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, none of them are, you know, not – I would not say that any one of them are actually wrong. It's just the interpretation of how they look at it. You know, it's, uh, you know, um, just like um, our friend uh, Albert Einstein said, you know, it, it, the, the object uh, is moves uh, according to the beholder's view, so it's the same about how you perceive um, the game. So I, I'm not, uh, I'm not, con- you know, I don't think there's any conflicting ones, but it definitely is confusing for players who want a straightforward answer. Fair enough. Now, you could take that slow route that we're mentioning, or you could take the quick route and attend one of the guru's boot camp breakthrough experience. At the boot camp, you will make a quantum leap in your pickleball game and your confidence. It's exactly what you need to improve your game, and it's the fastest and proven method to move from beginner intermediate to an advanced level. And Prane, some may have attended one or more of your clinics in the past. What's the difference between a clinic and a boot camp? The clinic um, really works on the, the on the fundamentals, really the basic fundamental ones uh, to get an ideal serve in place, uh, an ideal um, return in place, uh, get a good understanding of the drop shots, a uh, good understanding of the dinks and the volleys and the putaways, and uh, just getting the fundamentals right because that's basically, you know, when it comes to when it comes to a consistent game plan is to you know to have an ideal or whatever that is uh for each one of you and then have it consistent that's the clinic part as far as the boot camp part it's a more intensive program and it has uh, seven different sessions now uh we've added an extra day and which includes um very specific um specific uh oriented uh, coaching and it is a limited group. It's generally only limited to eight people, whereas in a clinic, you know, you could have as many as 48 people uh, in a larger group with lots of assistance. Um, uh, but in a in a in a boot camp, it's limited to eight people, and it is uh, 
it is really intense program uh, with uh, seven different sessions. And it's very individualized and very geared to each one's personal game. And I actually work very personally in each one's personal game and try and find the best possible solution from each one's perspective, not mine, but theirs. And that's a good point. The, the way I described it to someone, and if you know a better analogy, I describe it as a kind of a funnel where everyone kind of goes in uh, together initially, and then the funnel, you know, you come out at the end. It just gets more and more individualized the more you go down into that funnel. That's a good analogy, Randy. I okay. appreciate that. No, thank you. And I think the only frame covered just about everything. Well, he did cover everything perfectly. Uh, the only thing I'll add is it's pretty much designed for 3.0, 3.5, and 4.0 players. This isn't to say that other people won't get anything out of it, but this is pretty much uh, what you've designed this for, right, Prime? Absolutely. Uh, the idea is that the, uh, the players already have a basic sound fundamental understanding of the game, uh, knowing how to serve, how to return, how to at least know how to hit a drop shot, even if it is not consistent, but at least know how to hit a drop shot or have an understanding what a drop shot is. And um, and I'll at least try an effort to try and put that in place in their game, the dings and the volleys, um, and get an understanding of general understanding on how to be on the court. That would already be a big, big advantage when they come into the boot camps because then we start working very specifically on some very specific information and uh, and getting them consistent on each one of those domains so that they actually can have a very solid platform where they can actually improve and they generally improve very quickly. So that's kind of a general boot camp overview. Uh, to get more specific, what p participants are going to really get out of boot camp is you're going to see all those bad habits that you develop disappear, like all the five mistakes that you have if you come from another racket sport. You're going to develop the mindset to recognize the shot that you want to attack. You're going to add new shots to your arsenal, and you're going to do all this in the fastest way out there. So I want to talk about the structure of boot camp a little bit. There's four plus hours of on-court training on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then there's three plus hours on Monday, so that's 15 plus total hours. There's going to be seven on-court training sessions. There's going to be additional court time for the real fanatics that want to play and do some more drills. Lunch is going to be provided for three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And every day there's going to be water, sports drinks, and light snacks. The only other thing we want to mention is that other meals and accommodations are not included. There's also going to be um, uh, a dinner where everyone gets together if they desire to on Friday night, that's also not included. And let's go ahead and talk about the seven on-court training sessions. Prem, tell us what goes on in the first session, evaluation and assessment. Since it's my first time getting in touch with uh, most players who come into the, into the boot camp, it's my first time to sort of get an idea um, how the the group is, and so uh, have them play multiple games in different partnerships uh, to get an idea on each one's game and where they are in uh, in their game, and so that I can actually pair um, the group in a certain uh, setup where I know that they would ideally be in that in, will find themselves in an ideal group. So it takes about the whole first session to really sort of assess and evaluate where each one's skill level is and where they are in their game and what particularly I might have to look into their personal game, uh, even though I have some um, pre-information uh, on their on their games and uh, on their requests and their desires to improve. Um, I have a good idea on what I need to work individually on each one's uh, skill sets and how to get them to that next level. So that's what I'll be looking at. And during that session, I normally spend time towards halfway point. I start already starting to make some tweaks in how uh, I want them to understand what is happening in their game. And one of those that's, tweaks may be uh, checking out that grip to see if they need to change it up or do something different with it. Absolutely. It could be a grip. It could be, uh, you know, the way they, they are, you know, how their body posture is. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, where their weight transfer happens. Uh, it could be um, a few number of things uh, in the game, but there's a lot of things I look into, uh, why they miss shots or why is 
the stressed fighters. So the first half part of that session, I let them to be. I I totally get it that they're nervous and they're trying to you know uh, find their their groove and so till they settle into it and then I but I get already a lot of notion information on that and start tweaking around it for the first session. And even at the first session, I know you're saying that you're just kind of generally looking around, but even at the first session, it sounds like you're getting very specific and individualized for each person in terms of what that person needs to do to improve. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do, you know, and uh, and try and find the ideal, you know, information which would does individually suit them. You know, what I could say to someone in a specific manner might not suit for the other person. So I had to find the right dose and languaging to to actually, you know, to see what exactly their uh, game plan is so that I can actually set it up the way they want it. Um, and so boot camp is all about uh, the participants and nothing about me. Very good. And moving on to session number two, the, this is the second session on Friday. You think the drop shot is pretty important, right, Prem? Drop shot, I consider, is one of the critical part of the game. You know, it could be the third shot, it could be the fifth or the seventh, but it is definitely the critical part for any serving team to try and to get to the non-volley zone line. And um, it's sometimes a very complex one. It's the most difficult one to master, and a lot of people have generally ask me, um, I would really like to get consistent with the drop shots. So we work on this session called Drop Till You Drop, which is basically a drop shot session from any part of the court, anywhere. And you just work and work and work in different angles and different um, you know, sets, different uh, positioning, and uh, force you to actually make the transition to get to that, um, to that non-volley zone line safely by hitting those drop shots. It could be the third ball, it could be the fifth ball, it could be the seventh or the ninth. But we try and work it in a different way. Even if it's a, you know, it could be a third ball drive, and but then it could be the fifth ball drop. Uh, either way, we try to work in different scenarios, and so that they get total mastery of drop shots by the time that session is over. And for session three, uh, participants kind of morph from a tiger into a shark. This is where you want to get people to be a shark at the net and dominate the net. Absolutely, that's a very fun session too. It's uh, it's all about the dings, the volleys, and the putaways. It's really, really knowing um, well how to to get consistent with your shots uh, at the at the close range, and not give any opportunity for your opponent to attack you. And uh, so this whole session is all about the net play and being, you know, knowing how to dominate the net. Um, and knowing when to put the ball away, when you know how to keep the ball in a place where it is not attackable by your opponents, but uh, and set up your ways to so that you can attack a ball. So it's a, it's a fun session. It uh, it also is a very draining session for most of uh, my students because by the time the session is over, they are happy it is over. <laughs> for session number four. Uh, just to give a little preface to this, you, you say that the difference between a 4-0, a 4-5, and a 5-0 player, it's not really athleticism or skill, it's consistency. And session number four, that's all you focus on is consistency. Absolutely. Um, the whole Every session is all about consistency, but this is a session is all about that. It's about really developing a certain consistent manner in every strokes you hit at least to the, this point all the fundamentals will come into play and are trying to get consistent so that you don't miss any more serves you don't miss any more returns you don't you know uh, miss hard hitting balls coming at you at 100 miles an hour speed and knowing how to block it how to do a block volley how to do a punch volley um, and a lot of players uh, we use the old ball machine out there and have them just speed the ball right at their face so that they they don't have to be afraid anymore uh, when it comes to that. Uh, the best, best, best uh, suggest, uh, the testimonial I would have is from an 89-year-old gentleman who had come to a boot camp and who obviously at the beginning was struggling about all these hard-hitting balls coming to him. 
he got um, when we started playing the, uh, this particular session, he had got hit a few times, but he he stuck with it and uh, started blocking balls, punching balls uh, consistently, and got very very good at it, and never backed up from that from that non volley zone line. And a few weeks later, after that, he had participated in a tournament where he actually had to play down in the 70 year old category when he was 89 and uh they were hitting hard balls at him and he was able to block every ball wow. and he called me back and he said i was so joyful that i did not back up and i was able to block every ball and i won the tournament and he said in this very simplistic way bring it on baby bring it on baby that's right now we're going to move to everybody's favorite session, session five. This is where you break out the old disco shoes, right, Prane? Absolutely. That's one of my favorite sessions, and in fact, one of the favorite sessions of all the participants we've had. And, you know, I think we have overwhelming favorite on that particular session. It's called Dancing with Your Partners, and definitely you have to bring your dancing shoes here. Um uh, no kidding. It's really all about partner play, partner communication, and knowing how to play. It's all about placement and positioning. And it's all, this whole session is all, will come together for most of you, most of all the participants out there. It'll come together to know, have a clear understanding where to be on the court and so that they are no more taken taken uh, you know advantage of from the, by their opponents and to be always in position and it's one of the session which becomes a aha moment for most of the 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 students who participate in this boot camp and it is a big eye opener for them and uh, by the time the session is over they are over the moon over the moon and the next session it used to be the last session on day three and this is a bit of a spoiler alert but this is the session where you want participants to really take all this information home with them. And uh, this is where you provide them an individualized game plan frame. Absolutely. This particular session is a very unique individualized session. And I take every one of the eight participants separately and spend about 25 minutes to an hour uh, at times to try and give them very specific information on what I want them to work for the next few weeks and months. And uh, because I track them and I call them back and find out exactly what they do uh, and how, where they are, their progress, and if they are struggling, if there's anything I could do to help them out, give them some suggestions or, you know, tips to, to, to make that, that whatever they are struggling with in, in, to a different level. So this is a very individualized session, uh, very specific to the uh, game plan I want them to set up so that it's like a homework uh, for them when they go home so that they know what they have to specifically work on. Uh, and it's a very, very individually geared session. I love the session, and uh, all the participants love the session uh, because it really, um, you know, really brings them home to to a certain place that they have been um, really been seen for their individual skill sets. And former students have asked for it, and you delivered. Uh, boot camp used to end on Sunday with that sixth session. Former students asked for it, and you delivered what used to be the last session on Sunday. Now there's a special seventh session on Monday morning praying. Can you discuss that a little bit? Absolutely. There's been a, you know, there was a wide range of requests about that. You know, they really wanted to spend more time they, because they really loved it for sure, uh, but they also wanted to spend time in trying to you know put that in a game strategy and see how that works so the seventh session is all about them playing out the games of all the things they learned through the weekend um and um, me giving them very specific information on how they're faring and what they need to do when they're not doing it it's so i let the game goes on they play like regular multiple games against each other in different combinations and each and every time I stop and check with them and tell them, here's what's happening, why this happened, or whenever the mistake happens, I'm going to let it go, and then I'll, I'll stop and ask them specific questions on why this particular error happened and what needed to happen for that to not to happen. And then re, when they refocus and replay that point and then see how that actually works out. And um, it's, a, it's a fun session. Uh, we, uh, we did it uh, last time uh, for the first time, uh, a popular request. And 
it was uh, hugely successful and people really loved it. Um, and uh, it uh, it actually culminated everything they had picked up through the weekend into into session, which actually gave them a lot more clarity on how to work around their game. What I always talk about is you can drill, drill, drill. Um, you, you can take, you can watch all the YouTubes that you want. You can uh, take clinics and boot camps. But once you get into that game situation, a lot of that just kind of disappears. And this is where the advantage for that seventh session comes in. Absolutely. It was, um, uh, I'll be very honest with you, it was an eye-opener to me as much as it was to the students. And um, that is why I think uh, we have added that session so that it actually helps them uh, look into their game in a more precise way so that they can see from where they started to where they are actually at that point. Thanks, Prem. Uh, just so that everyone knows, Prem is an IPTPA certified coach. He's been a three-time featured coach at USAPA Nationals, and he has personally invested thousands of hours in developing his game and his smart pickleball philosophy. And there's that two ten thousand hour rule, Prem, I'm, uh, where you have, in order to be an expert, you have to do it for ten thousand hours. You've more than surpassed ten thousand hours of pickleball, I'm guessing. I'm guessing too. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you said ten hours a day, I, I cannot imagine that you're uh, anywhere under ten thousand. Uh, the the other thing I'll add, I, I was actually with Prame when we were at the U.S. Open, and there, there were lots of pros that would come around to consult with Prame on how to improve their game or correct some of their mechanics. One of the best success stories that we have, uh, this is a year or two ago, is from Charlotte. She could quote the book, but she was clearly the weakest player at boot camp. Uh, before boot camp, no one wanted to play with Charlotte at, uh, at wherever she was playing in her rec games. But after boot camp, Charlotte now chooses who she wants to play with, including top players in the area. And Charlotte's transformation post boot camp is fairly typical. And Prem, there was, um, uh, I know you don't have any data on this, but I think, and I'm going to reference Uncle Dale, but you say people generally move up at least uh, 0.5 level, um, maybe even one point. So if someone came in at a three, they may move up to a four. If someone came in at a 3.5, they would certainly move up to a four. And I think uh, Uncle Dale shared that with you, that he got raided and he had moved up to a 3.5 after being a 3.0. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, and you're right. I, I probably don't have, uh, um, you know, compiled the data on it, but I do know that most players who I have trained, and it's a pretty large segment, uh, have moved, uh, you know, uh, from whatever level they were to the next level. Um pretty seamlessly in less than a few months after the boot camp was over because they had put the time and effort. Obviously, you know, going coming to a boot camp is an important part, but putting in application what was learned and and being able to practice it is a different set of game plan. But once you get those two in place, there is I can guarantee you that you will improve. And Very I will do everything in my possibility to make that transition for you guys. Very good. For a quick boot camp recap, uh, we limit this to eight guests to ensure that you get the individualized attention. It takes place over the course of four days with 15 plus total hours of individualized instruction. There's seven distinct sessions designed to improve your entire game, and you get an individual assessment to continue improve. That's that sixth session. And Prem, you also contact all the participants, what, two weeks, a month after boot camp to make sure that everything's going okay and they're applying everything that they learned? Absolutely. And I keep tracking them over time, too. So I just don't do it only on one session after they have, you know, a month after they left. But I do keep track of them and check in with them to see where they are. Um, and Randy, you know by now that uh, we've had uh, a, a few number of uh, people who have uh, returned back uh, from those boot camps again, 
to different bo other boot camps because they absolutely loved what they had and they want to re-experience it again one right. more time. And the other thing that you get when you sign up for boot camp is you get access to the drop shot master class. And Prane, you say this is the most comprehensive drop shot course ever developed. So it's, it's something good that someone can go into. Uh, actually, they get access to it right away. So that way they have time to kind of go through it and start doing the practice sessions from it before they even get to boot camp. That's right. And it's, uh, uh, again, I wouldn't probably pretend or claim that it's the most comprehensive, but definitely something which was uh, done with a lot of heart and a lot of dedication from uh, me and my team to put that one in place because it's a, it's a, it's a very fully uh, furnished uh um, drop shot masterclass online series for sure. Uh, right now, the other thing that we're offering, if you sign up by August 31st, you're going to get a free 30 minute Skype or FaceTime session with Prem. Prem, can you discuss what makes this so valuable? What makes this as valuable is like in this particular session, you can put your phone while you are playing in your local club or local court wherever you are on your on your on Skype or on FaceTime and you can play for 10 minutes and then uh, you know come on to the phone and where I'll be watching the match while you do that and then I can give you actually live comments on what happened and what needs to improve even in that particular session so that you already have a certain number of tools to in place for you to be able to improve even before you come into the into the boot camp so that you already have certain tools you can you can work on your consistency great you'll also get both versions of Prame's book smart pickleball you'll get an ebook version as well as a soft cover version you'll get a guru signature paddle you'll get a smart pickleball t-shirt in addition to getting a whole whole lot including an experience that will most definitely improve your game, there's a lot of other components that are also going to help improve your game for the Boot Camp Breakthrough Experience. And right now we're offering the Boot Camp Breakthrough Experience for $1,497. That's $500 off the usual price. Right now there's only two spots available for the Vail, Colorado Boot Camp at the end of this month in August and the Sacramento, California Boot Camp at the end of October. And I believe there's only four spots available in the Tucson, Arizona boot camp, which is in November. And Prane, we started opening up some of the 2019 dates and locations. Uh, there's two different, lo two different sessions in Vero Beach, Florida in January and Richmond in May. There's also boot camps in France and Costa Rica. So the ones in the States, you're also offering the discount for both the 2018 and 2019 boot camps. Is that correct? Absolutely, Randy. All right. So if you're ready to improve your pickleball game, register today at pballbootcamp.com. Be sure to use the coupon code at the website for your choice of location of the Boot Camp Breakthrough Experience. If you have any questions whatsoever, if you have questions about Boot Camp, you can contact Prame at 773-615-0478 or send him an email at prame at thepickleballguru.com. Or on the website that we just told you about, pballbootcamp.com, there's actually a link to where you can schedule a call and you can set whatever time and date that the call is and Prem will call you back. Any other questions about anything else at all, you can call me at 703-459-0001 or send me an email at randy at the pickleballguru.com. And that concludes our webinar. Prem, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Nothing else, Randy. Hope uh, the Guru Nation enjoys it, and I wish everyone a fantastic and blissful year. Great. Thank you so much, Prem. Thank you. For it. It's certainly a life-changing experience for your pickleball game.